Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Brown. I work as a developer relations engineer for Google. And today, we're going to untangle coroutine testing together. Uh, here, I'm going to assume that you are already using coroutines and you have some idea of testing. And today, we're going to make those two meet and uh, see how you can test your code that uses coroutines. A very brief look at the agenda. We're going to start from the very basics of how you can call suspending functions in tests. Then we're going to look at the available APIs for coroutine testing. Then we're going to dive into some best practices around this and uh, see some Android specifics, like what you can do with the main dispatcher in tests. And finally, we're also going to touch on flows and state flows briefly. So uh, why are we talking about testing coroutines? Uh, because it's not trivial to do. Uh, you have to be able to call suspending functions within your tests. You're going to have code that runs in parallel and on multiple threads. And you're going to have jobs that are running that you have to await within your tests. Uh, so we're going to cover all of those things. Luckily, to do this, we get Kotlin X coroutines test from JetBrains, which is a library of utilities for testing coroutines. This topic has been covered before uh, by Sean and Manuel at uh, Android Dev Summit 2019. Um, so that's almost three years ago now. And the APIs have changed a bit since then. And we also have more time than 20 minutes, luckily, today. So that's why we're covering this yet again. So about those API changes. Uh, we used to have one set of APIs in Kotlin X Coroutines test before version 1.6. And from 1.6 going forward, we have brand new APIs. If you've tested coroutines before using the old ones, you might have seen these, uh, things like run blocking test, test coroutine dispatcher, and so on. And this is what the new APIs look like. We're going to have things like run test, test dispatcher, test scope, and we're going to discuss all of those in this talk. Now, <clears throat> now the old APIs have always been experimental, uh, but now they're also deprecated. So it's going to be time to move away from them in favor of the new ones, which are also still experimental. But we're really hoping that these ones are going to go stable instead of uh, going the way of deprecations. Uh, there is a migration guide from JetBrains uh, that's very comprehensive and includes how you can move from the old APIs to the new ones if you need to do that. And we're also going to cover some small bits of how the old APIs map to the new ones uh, within this talk. Um, the old APIs are going to be errors to use in 1.7, which is late this year. And in about a year, with 1.8, they're scheduled to be removed completely. So please do migrate away from them. So uh, how do you do that? Uh, starting with the basics of testing coroutines, let's see how you can call suspending functions within your tests. We're going to start with a very simple suspending function, which is just going to delay for one second, and then it's going to return hello world. To test this function, this is the test method that I might want to write. Uh, here, as you can see, I'm calling that method, and then I'm asserting on the return value. This code, as it is, would not compile, because you can only call suspending functions from other suspending functions. You have this chicken and egg problem here. And um, here, we have to bridge the blocking and the suspending worlds, uh, which we do by using coroutine builders, uh, both in production and in testing code. Uh, in tests, we have a special coroutine builder uh, from the testing library called runTest that we can use to wrap our test. And this way, we can make suspending calls because this creates a new coroutine for us and runs the code passed to it in that new coroutine. And this test would succeed. RunTest also gives you some uh, neat extras. For example, this delay that would take one real second in production code will complete immediately uh, within tests, so you don't have to wait for it. And your entire test will be just a couple milliseconds. I'm using a convention here, which is to use an expression body for the methods that use RunTest. So I'm just directly returning the um, RunTest method from my uh, test functions. And this is a nice convention to get into. Uh, it's not strictly required if you're only running this on the JVM. But the testing library also supports multi-platform. And if you want to target JavaScript with your tests, then this is a requirement to return the return value of run tests. So it's, it's a good habit to get into. So that's the basics of testing suspending functions. Uh, run test will get you a lot of the way there. But if you're doing more interesting things within your code that you're testing, you'll need to do some extra stuff. For example, uh, what if your method that you're testing switches dispatchers internally? For example, here I'm switching to the IO dispatcher within the fetch data method. Now, run test will still work because coroutines are sequential. Uh, everything will happen in order as expected. However, 
now I'm going to have a real one second delay in my test because I'm doing that delay on the IO dispatcher. And my test is also going to run across multiple threads. Let's visualize that to make sure that we understand what happens. So here I'm going to have the test thread and the IO dispatcher's thread. I am calling fetch data as the first thing during the test, uh, which will do a weight context to the IO dispatcher moving this top level coroutine uh, to, uh, to some thread on the IO dispatcher. There, I'm doing a one second delay, and once that's done, that real one second delay is done, uh, then I'm returning the hello world string, going back to the test thread where I make the assertion which succeeds. So as you can see, this still works, but it's not ideal because we have that delay that we have to wait for. Another typical problem that you can have when you're testing coroutines is that you can be starting new coroutines within your tests, which is not infrequent. And if you're doing that, you have to take care about how those new coroutines are going to be scheduled. Uh, there are several ways of doing this. Uh, here's a direct example first. Uh, here we are creating a user repository. Then we're launching two new coroutines that will register two different users into that repository. And finally, we're asserting the contents of the repository expecting that those users are now going to be there. Here, it's very obvious that we're creating new coroutines. We have these calls to coroutine builders right within the test body. It can also be less obvious that you're starting new coroutines within your tests, because you might be doing them inside the code that you are testing. For example, take this very simplified implementation for a view model that has an initialized method that launches a new coroutine in view model scope and uses that coroutine to load some data about a user asynchronously. If you're testing this view model, uh, you might do something like this, create an instance, initialize it, and then assert on the user that was supposed to be loaded. Here, we don't have any coroutine um, builders used within the actual test code, and we also don't have any suspension points within our test code. However, we are still starting a new coroutine, and we have to handle that somehow. As it is, both of these tests would fail, but we'll take a look at how you can fix these problems um, during this talk. Before we do that, though, we have to learn a bit about the available testing APIs, which all come in Kotlin X Coroutines test. Starting with run test, which we're already familiar with. Uh, because we have structured concurrency for coroutines, run test has to run the new coroutine for your test in some kind of coroutine scope. And it uses an implementation called the test scope for this. What the test scope does is that it will always use a test dispatcher to execute your uh, coroutine. And uh, this dispatcher will handle the scheduling of new coroutines, as well as provide delay skipping um, behavior. And the way that it does this is it will delegate almost all of that work to something called a test coroutine scheduler, which is, I promise, the last concept that you have to learn during this talk. So this scheduler is the actual source of truth during your test. Uh, this is what will keep track of virtual time and also keep track of all of the coroutines that are running within your test. While TestScope uh, creates a test dispatcher for you, you can also create other ones manually. What's really important, though, and it's so important that I've written it on a slide, is that you must share the same scheduler between all of these test dispatchers. Uh, this way, they have a shared understanding of virtual time, and that single scheduler will know about all of the coroutines that are running. Now, Test Dispatcher is an interface, and it has two different implementations. Both of them provide delay skipping. Both of them rely on a scheduler uh, to do their work, but they have different behavior for how they schedule new coroutines that you start on them. Uh, these two implementations are standard and unconfined Test Dispatcher. Standard, standard Test Dispatcher is going to queue up those new coroutines and uh, wait for the thread to be free uh, so that it can run them, or you can also advance it manually while unconfined test dispatcher will start your new coroutines eagerly. We're going to look at all of that in detail now. So starting with standard test dispatcher, if you create a new coroutine on this dispatcher, it will put it into a queue on the scheduler. Uh, this is quite similar, by the way, to how production dispatchers would work. They would be queuing up all of the coroutines that are supposed to run on the thread or threads that they manage and run those coroutines when the thread is available. You will then need to either yield the thread to those coroutines or better uh, advance those coroutines manually using the available testing APIs. And finally, it's worth noting that run test, when it creates a test scope, will also uh, create a standard test dispatcher by default. Uh, or rather, test scope, when it's created by run test, will create a standard test dispatcher by default, and that's where it will start your test coroutine. So in a test like this, um, 
we are launching two new coroutines. It's the same example from before, registering two users in two coroutines. And because we are calling launch inside Runtest, we are launching those coroutines in the test scope, which means that these two new coroutines will inherit the standard test dispatcher from the test scope. Uh, let's see what happens if we run this test line by line uh, with the different coroutines. So here's our test thread. We're going to start running our code. We're going to create the instance of user repository. Then we launch our first coroutine, uh, which will create that new coroutine, but not run it yet. Instead, it will queue it up on the scheduler, and that coroutine will be waiting uh, to um, get some time to execute. Then launch uh, will immediately return, which is quite similar, again, to how launch would behave in production code. The second launch also happens. Uh, this second coroutine also gets queued up on the scheduler, waiting to be executed. As these calls return, we get to the assertion, which fetches the users from the repo synchronously. And we perform the assertion on the users. And because we have not actually registered either of the users yet, this test is going to fail. So what do we do to fix this? We need to advance the coroutines that we created manually. Uh, let's take a couple coroutines as an example. Let's imagine that these are some coroutines that are running, um, that are waiting on our scheduler. The first coroutines here have no constraints. They are ready to be executed right now, uh, like the ones that we are starting within our test. And the rest are waiting for some amount of time to pass. So we can imagine that they ha uh, are some continuations of coroutines that are due to take place after some delay call. The first method that we have to advance coroutines is run current. This will run all tasks that are ready to be executed at the current virtual time. Then we have advanced time by, which will first advance time by the given number of milliseconds. Let's say that we call it with 100 milliseconds. And then it will run all of the pending things on the scheduler that were due before that time. So in our example, it would run these four coroutines. But very importantly, it will not run the task that was due at exactly 100 milliseconds in the future, according to the test time. And finally, we have advance until idle, which is really the simplest of these methods. It will look at the scheduler, and then it will run all of the tasks that are on there, and only then return. So this way, you can just drain the scheduler of all pending tasks, and be sure that all of your coroutines have completed before you proceed to other things within your test. To fix our previous test code, we could use basically any of these methods. Uh, I'm going to use the simplest one and the broadest one, which is to call advance until idle. Now if we run our code again, we're going to create the repository. We're going to create both coroutines, putting them into the queue. But then we hit advance until idle, which will tar start looking at the scheduler, taking tasks from there, and executing them. So first, it would take the first coroutine that was waiting there and register Alice. Then it would proceed to run the second one and register Bob. And because the scheduler is now empty, advance until idle would return and let our assertion take place, which is now successful because we have actually registered the users before this. The other implementation we have is unconfined test dispatcher. Uh, this starts new coroutines eagerly when you launch something on it. Uh, this is the same behavior that run blocking tests used to have in case you've used the old APIs before. Uh, this can be a good choice for simple tests, because in general, you will have to uh, have fewer calls to things like advance until idle within your test code, so it can simplify your test code a bit. However, and this is really important, it does not emulate how coroutine scheduling works in production code. It doesn't emulate concurrency well. So if you're testing for concurrency, you should avoid unconfined test dispatcher, and you should prefer using the standard one instead whenever possible. If we want to run the previous test using an unconfined test dispatcher, what we have to do is we have to create an instance of it and pass it into run test. This way, uh, this test dispatcher will be used in the scope. And when we are launching new coroutines on the scope, they will, they will launch uh, according to the behaviors of unconfined test dispatcher. So if we just run this test, we're going to create the repository. Then we're going to launch our first coroutine. And because, we're be and because we're launching on an unconfined test dispatcher, uh, this coroutine is going to Enter, going to be entered eagerly, which means that Alice is registered immediately right before launch returns. The same happens for the second launch. Uh, during the call to launch, the registration will happen, and only then will launch return. And finally, we can assert on the contents of the repo, and this is going to be successful. So as you can see, our test code is a bit simpler here, but we are, we're also not testing for anything concurrency-related within this test.
To quickly summarize test dispatchers, we have the standard one, which will queue up new coroutines, and you should use this by default. And we have the unconfined one, which starts new coroutines eagerly, and you should use this selectively within your testing. Uh, some good use cases for it are when you're migrating tests from the old APIs, and those tests have been relying on this eagerly starting behavior, although you should try to uh, use standard test dispatcher in your tests and see if they will still work, as probably a lot of them uh, will be okay. And we'll also see some other examples during this talk later on, which is to use this as the main dispatcher or to use it for coroutines that are going to be collecting some values. A really important best practice for coroutine testing is going to be to inject dispatchers. Whenever you have a class that relies on a dispatcher, instead of hard coding it, you should be providing it uh, to the class as a parameter. Let's first take an example of a class that uses hard-coded dispatchers for various things and examine what happens when we try to test this class. So this repository does two things. Uh, first, it has an, an initialize method where it launches a new coroutine, and inside the new coroutine that it launches on the IO dispatcher, it's going to populate the underlying database with some kind of initial data. Then it has another method, which is a suspending method, that will switch the caller to the I.O. dispatcher and read data from the database. If we're testing this repository, we might write a test like this, where we are creating an instance of it, uh, passing in some fake database implementation. Then we're initializing the repository, and after that, we're trying to fetch the data to verify that it's there. Let's visualize what happens. Uh, this time, we're going to have the test thread and a couple threads from the I.O. dispatcher. So first, on the test thread, we create our repository. Uh, then we call initialize, which will launch a brand new coroutine. This is um, signaled by the dotted line on the chart. That's a second coroutine within our test. And that new coroutine is running on the IO dispatcher, doing the work to populate the database with some values. Launch will return immediately here, which means that initialize also returns immediately. So while that coroutine is running, our main coroutine calls into fetch data which moves its execution to the I.O. dispatcher and reads from the database there. Then we exit the fetch data call, it returns some data, and we try to assert on that data. The question is, is this test successful or is it going to fail? Well, it really depends on our luck at this point. So if we were lucky, then the populate call was scheduled quickly enough and it completed quickly enough that the, by the time that we read the data, it was actually there and we got what we were expecting. If we are less lucky, the populate call got scheduled too late on the IO dispatcher, or it took too long, and it, the data wasn't there when we were reading it, so our assertion is going to fail. This is a classic race condition, and it leads to a flaky test. Uh, if we were really unlucky, the populate call takes a very long time, and it keeps going even outside of our test, possibly causing side effects while our other tests are executing, which is really undesirable. So uh, what do we do to fix this? We're going to, as the title says, inject dispatchers. So instead of hardcoding dispatchers.io in both of, both of these different use cases within the repository, we're going to inject it as a parameter. So uh, this is what that could look like. Uh, here I'm doing this manually by adding a constructor parameter and just defaulting it to the IO dispatcher. Uh, you could also provide this value in production using dependency injection like Hilt. Uh, so now, whenever I launch a new coroutine in, in, in Initialize, or when I switch to the I.O. dispatcher in Fetch Data, those are actually going to use whatever dispatcher I passed in as a parameter. So let's get back to our test and actually pass in a dispatcher now. For this, I'm going to create a new standard test dispatcher that I'm going to pass in to the repository, and I'm going to make sure that I'm sharing schedulers uh, remember, run test will also create a standard test dispatcher, so I'm now creating my second test dispatcher within my test, and all test dispatchers must share just a single test scheduler instance, which you can grab from the scope um, by reading a property from it. So uh, now if I run my code, I'm going to create the repository. This happens on the test thread. Then I'm going to call initialize which still launches a new coroutine, but now it launches it on a test dispatcher. And it launches it on a standard test dispatcher, so it doesn't get started yet. Instead, it's waiting in the queue to be executed on the scheduler. Uh, then I've added an advanced until idle call here, which will uh, take a look at the scheduler and run the populate call and wait for its completion before it returns. With this, I can now proceed to go to fetch data, which would normally switch threads to the IO dispatcher, but now because we've replaced that with a test dispatcher, we'll just simply do the read on the test thread. Uh, 
And finally, I can assert on the data I've received, which is definitely going to be successful because all of the operations happened in order this time. So um, something really important to note here is that this API that my repository class has is bad, and you should not do this. Um, this initialize method is launching a new coroutine on the IO dispatcher, and it has and it expects clients to know when this coroutine is completed, because only after the initialization is completed are the other methods of the repository safe to call. However, it doesn't expose any way for clients to wait for the completion of that new coroutine that it creates. In tests, we could work around this by injecting a test dispatcher, where we can just call advance until idle and make sure that all of the pending coroutines are done, but that's not something that you could do in production code. So if this method does have to start a new coroutine, and if it has to do this asynchronously, we could just call async and return a deferred object from the method. This way, both in production code and test code, we could await its completion. And um, that way, we would know that that task has completed and it's safe to do other things. Or we might just realize that this doesn't need to run concurrently by default, and then we could just make this a regular suspending method that will, by default, wait for other suspending method calls within it to complete before it returns. So uh, we had a serious problem of having a coroutine runoff here. We lost track of that new coroutine, which we started in a new scope and on the IO dispatcher. We had no way of knowing when it completes, and we didn't have any idea what it's doing during our test. So it's quite important to keep track of our coroutines, and run test is actually quite friendly in this regard. It will wait for coroutines to complete before it returns to make sure that they are done executing uh, within the bounds of your test, but it has to know about these coroutines in order to wait for them. So run test will wait for those coroutines if it knows about them, and there are two ways uh, that it can do that. First, if the coroutines are started as children of the test coroutine, uh, so in the test scope, then run test will be able to know about them and wait for them before it returns. And alternatively, even if they're not running in the test scope, if they are running on a test scheduler, because the scheduler is shared between all test dispatchers, run test will also be able to look at the scheduler and wait for those coroutines to complete before it returns. Quick examples of both of these things. Uh, here's an example when we're launching a new coroutine uh, within run test as a child, and we're launching it on the IO dispatcher. This launch happens immediately, and run test could return at that point, uh, but the new coroutine that it started uh, will still run for at least half a second, and because it was started as a child to run test, run test will know that it has to wait for it. Uh, with the old APIs, by the way, with run blocking test, uh, this is a classic thing that would fail your test with a large error that uh, told you that you still had uncompleted child jobs. Uh, with run test, it will wait for these cor coroutines to complete by default uh, up to 60 seconds. And you can also customize that timeout if you want to. So if you don't want to uh, be that lenient within your tests, you can restrict that to some shorter timeout. For another example of things that run test can keep track of, uh, let's take this socket service class that has an IO dispatcher as a parameter, and it has a shutdown method where you can uh, shut down the service. We can imagine that this is managing some kind of WebSocket connection, and when you call shutdown, it launches this new coroutine for some asynchronous cleanup to close the WebSocket connection to free up some resources and so on. So if we're testing this service, uh, we can create a standard test dispatcher sharing schedulers, uh, importantly, with the test scope and inject that into the socket service. This way, the new coroutine that is started by calling shutdown is going to be something that Runtest knows about. So Runtest will wait for the completion of that new coroutine, even though it's not a child in the test scope, but it's running on the test scheduler, so Runtest can take a look at that and wait for its completion so that this shutdown logic is not running while other tests are executing. Something important that you have to take care of on Android is handling the main dispatcher, which represents the UI thread normally. Uh, this dispatcher is not going to be available in, UI te in unit tests uh, because you're not running on an Android device, so uh, you don't have the UI thread available. In some cases, you can replace the main dispatcher by injecting it the same way as we've seen for other dispatchers, but there are some APIs where you cannot do this. A classic example of that is view models where we have a view model scope extension that you can use to easily launch coroutines within view models. This will, by default, use dispatcher's main 
uh, under the hood, and you have no way of customizing this and injecting another dispatcher implementation. Um, so here we have this home view model, uh, which launches a new coroutine, and inside that new coroutine uh, that it launches on view model scope, it will uh, set some data into a state flow that the UI can then observe. If we want to test this view model, uh, this is something that uh, we could write. So we're creating an instance, we're, we're calling load message, and on the next line, we want to assert that the message has actually been loaded by that new coroutine. Uh, here, because we cannot inject the main dispatcher, we have to do something else, and the testing library uh, contains dispatcher's set main, which you can use to statically replace the main dispatcher with a, another dispatcher instance. Here, I'm going to pass in a test dispatcher, of course. Uh, after you do this, uh, you must not forget that you also have to reset main after each of your tests, so we could do that by wrapping our actual test code in a try finally and resetting main after the test is done. So uh, with these uh, changes, now main dispatcher is going to be a test dispatcher implementation, and whenever we call view model load message, it's going to use this test dispatcher to launch the new coroutine, and this test will succeed. I want to highlight here that I've used an unconfined test dispatcher for this use case, uh, because in this specific case, this is actually a realistic production behavior, as view model scope would use dispatcher's main immediate under the hood, and what that does is, if you're calling the load message method on the main thread, it will launch new coroutines eagerly, just like unconfined test dispatcher does, uh, without waiting for a dispatch to happen, um, just to optimize things a bit. So uh, in this case, when you're replacing the main thread, you might actually want to use unconfined test dispatcher. Now, uh, this pattern of doing set main, reset main in each test is tedious, so you would want to factor this out to somewhere else. Um, you could put it into before, after functions, or you can just extract these into a uh, test rule uh, with JUnit4. With JUnit5, you could do the same thing with an extension. So what this rule does for uh, JUnit tests is it will create an unconfined test dispatcher by default, and before each test, it will set that as the main dispatcher, and after each test, it will clear the main dispatcher. Here's how you would use this rule in an actual test. Uh, you could create an instance of it as a property of the test class and annotate it with the rule. Uh, this time, in your actual test code, which is uh, our greeting test here for the view model, you don't have to handle the main dispatcher anymore because the rule will take care of replacing that. Something really, really convenient about replacing the main dispatcher is that once you do that, once you set a test dispatcher as the main dispatcher, all other test dispatchers that are created after that point will automatically share schedulers with it, so you no longer have to pass around schedulers to make sure that your test is okay. In this case, uh, we have two different test dispatchers within our test. So we have, the main, uh, we have the one used for main, which is an unconfined test dispatcher, which the rule creates for us. And because that's set as the main dispatcher, um, when we call run test, which creates its own standard test dispatcher for the test routine, that will look at main, see the test dispatcher there, and grab the scheduler to make sure that it's shared. Let's take a look at that in more detail and see how you can make sure that you're managing these test objects correctly within your tests. For these examples, we're going to use uh, this uh, sample repository class, which just depends on some coroutine dispatcher. So uh, let's say that you are using this rule that we've just implemented, which will call dispatcher set main and pass in a test dispatcher uh, before each of your tests. We've already covered that calling run test at this point is safe. Even though it creates a new test dispatcher, that test dispatcher will share its scheduler with the already existing one that's set as main, so we are good here. What if we want to create an instance of the repository within our test? Well, if we're happy using the same type of test dispatcher, in this case, unconfined test dispatcher, as what the main rule is using, we could just take that test dispatcher and inject it into our repository. Alternatively, if we want the other type of test dispatcher, in this case, that would be standard, we can create a brand new instance of that, and because we have replaced main, this will also grab the scheduler, so we don't have to share it manually. And it's actually a good idea to create a new dispatcher instance, even if you're using the unconfined one uh, for your repository, even if you want to use that, uh, because otherwise you have this implicit dependency on whatever type of test dispatcher main has, and uh, this way it's much more clear uh, within just your test body uh, which type of test dispatcher you're creating and injecting into this class. <laughs> 
Another interesting example is what happens if you need those test dispatchers to be available outside of the test body as well. Uh, this is something that happens frequently in tests. You might want to create some of your objects that you're going to test as properties in the test class. For example, here, let's say that we want to create a repository as a property of the class. You might think that it's safe to just create a brand new test dispatcher instance here because we are replacing main anyway, but there's actually a very subtle timing issue here, which is that the main dispatcher rule will only replace the main dispatcher with a test dispatcher implementation right before the test happens. And this all takes place way after the properties of the test class are initialized. So when we're creating this unconfined test dispatcher to pass into our repository, main has not been replaced yet, so it's also going to create a second scheduler, and now we have two schedulers in our tests, which are going to cause uh, consistency pro problems, and in some cases, the testing library will catch it and just fail your test explicitly. So what can we do instead to make sure that we're not creating new schedulers? Well, if we're happy using the same type of test dispatcher as what the rule has, we can just take the test dispatcher from there. Or if we want to be more explicit about what type of test dispatcher we're passing in, we can extract the scheduler from the existing test dispatcher and pass that in as a parameter like this. You can, by the way, create all of these different testing objects that we're talking about explicitly if you need them outside of the test for some reason. So if you need to inject a test scope into one of your classes that you're testing, for example, you can create that explicitly as long as you then make sure that you're calling a run test on it to make it use the existing scope. As we've seen, you can also create the test dispatcher manually and you could place that into the scope yourself. And you can also go a step further and create the scheduler manually as well. Uh, this can be useful if you are, uh, for example, um, using dependency injection within your uh, tests. So this way you could like, make the scheduler a singleton in DI and make sure that you're using that whenever you're creating a new test dispatcher. OK, uh, let's talk a bit about flows. Uh, flows are these uh, asynchronous streams of data that are powered by coroutines. So if you're testing flows, you also have to take uh, care of uh, coroutine testing in a way. For this example, I'm going to use um, this code where I have a data source interface that produces some stream of integers, uh, a flow of integers. And I'm injecting this into a repository as a parameter, which is going to take the data from the data source and perform a very basic operation of just multiplying all of those uh, integers by 10. In a real repository, you would have a lot more transformations, and you would be combining data from multiple data sources, most likely but the general concepts remain the same. So to visualize this, uh, this is going to be our test setup, except I've simplified this to just a single data source. Um, I'm going to create a fake implementation of that data source, and I'm going to feed those predetermined values into the repository, and then I'm going to observe the, I'm going to collect the flow that the repository exposes and see if the repository's code is working correctly. So to create a fake implementation for the data source, I'm going to start with the simplest possible fake, which is going to be uh, just returning a cold flow, meaning that whenever someone starts collecting this flow, they will receive the exact same values, which is just going to, which is just going to be 1, 2, 3, and 4 this time. So for a test that uses this, I'm going to create a repository, pass in my fake implementation of the data source. And from here, I can use various terminal operators on the flow to grab values from it. So for example, I could take the flow from the repository, call the first terminal operator on it, and that would give me the first value, and I could make assertions against that. Or I could call to list on the flow that the repository returns. That way, I collect all of the values into a list, and I can make assertions on the individual items or the size of the list or anything like that. This only works if I know that my flow is going to complete after producing some amount of values. Uh, if the flow is potentially infinite, I can do something like this instead. I can use some flow operators to restrict it to something that I can definitely collect from it. So for example, I could take just the first two values of a flow, call two lists on that, and that way I will end up with a list that just collected the first two items of the flow, and again, I can make assertions against those. A more exciting example of faking this data source would be using a hot flow to back it instead of a cold one. So a hot flow exists even before you start collecting it. And in a test, we can easily use this to feed values into the um, repository from the data source manually. Here, I have a mutable shared flow, which is going to be the flow in the data source. Uh, 
I've also added a method where I can emit values into that shared flow, so anyone collecting them will receive them. And finally, this is the uh, flow instance that I'm returning from the interface method. So to test this, I'm now going to create an um, instance of my new uh, hot fake data source, and I'm passing that into the repository. Then I'm going to create a list, which is uh, what I'm going to use to collect the values that I'm collecting from the repository. And to do that collection, I'm going to launch a new coroutine. It's important that I'm launching a new coroutine for this instead of trying to collect in the main test coroutine, because collect will suspend until it receives values, and it will also not return until it has collected the entire flow. In this case, I have a hot flow, which would never complete normally. So instead of, of blocking my main test code with that, I'm going to launch a new concurrent coroutine. And I'm also launching this by using an unconfined test dispatcher, uh, which I'm just passing into launch to override the one that would be inherited from the test scope otherwise. And I'm launching this with an unconfined test dispatcher to make sure that this coroutine is entered eagerly and the collecting uh, coroutine starts listening for values immediately. So on the next line after launch, I will be ready to start receiving values. I can also simplify this code a bit, and uh, now I'm using collect manually, but I can also just call to list on a flow, which also collects the flow, and I can pass in a target list that it will place those values in, just to clean up my code. So uh, with this setup, and only after this collecting coroutine has been launched, uh, I can now emit values from the data source, the repository will process them, and my collecting coroutine will grab those values and place them into the values list. So now I can uh, do that emission from the data source, and I can assert that the value has landed in the list through the repository, and the operation has been applied to it. Really important, because I've launched a new coroutine that's collecting something which will never normally complete, I have to cancel that coroutine at the end of my test to make sure uh, that it's no longer pending. And with this setup, I can just dynamically keep emitting values from the data source within my test and seeing how my repository reacts to that and what values it produces. So I can just keep emitting values and asserting uh, what the repository has produced so far. Something you can use to simplify this a bit is the Turbine library, which is a third-party library from Cash App, and it's meant to, well, simplify uh, flow testing. To do the same test with Turbine, instead of creating a coroutine that collects from it, uh, we would call the test extension that the library provides on the flow that we want to collect. And this would do very much the same thing uh, under the hood. It would create a new coroutine that collects the flow, and it, and it exposes the values that it collects uh, with this API. So uh, we would have to call a wait item within the test block to receive each individual item that it has collected from the flow. So we could emit a value from the data source, it would go through the repository, uh, Turbine would collect it for us, and it would give it to us um, by uh, us calling the await item method. Importantly, if you don't want to assert against all of the values that are coming out of the repository's flow here, you would still have to await them uh, with Turbine to make sure that they are consumed. To learn more about the library, uh, check out their GitHub page. There's a lot more to their APIs. Finally, a word about testing state flows. Uh, state flows are an interesting concept. Um, they have this interesting duality where they are a flow, so you can collect them as a stream of values, uh, but they're also a state holder that only holds on to the latest value. And if you're writing values into it very rapidly, it might conflate values, which means that someone collecting from it might not see all of those values individually. You're only guaranteed to receive the latest value from a state flow. So they have this duality to them. Uh, let's see what that means for tests and how we can test a state flow. For this example, we're going to go one layer higher in the architecture than before. Now we're going to have an interface for a repository, which exposes a stream, of, a flow of integers. Um, then we're going to depend on that repository with a view model implementation. Within the view model, we're going to have a state flow that exposes the values to the UI, just the integer values. And we're going to have a method that launches a new coroutine in view model scope. And within that coroutine, it collects the values from the underlying repository, always placing the latest one it received into the state flow so that it's displayed on the UI. To visualize this quickly, uh, we're going to have a repository that we're going to fake um, because we have an interface for it. Uh, we're going to produce some fake values from that flow from the repository. Uh, 
then we're going to have our unit under test, which is a view model. And that's going to expose uh, to the test and to the UI in production um, these latest values that it collected as a state flow. So here, I'm going to use a cold fake again. So every time that this um, flow is call collected, uh, I'm going to emit the same values. I'm, again, just emitting 1, 2, and 3 in sequence. But to make it a bit more interesting, I'm also doing a 100 millisecond delay between these emissions from the repository. So to test this, I would write this code. I would create a main dispatcher rule within my test class because I'm launching things in view model scope. So I need to replace the main dispatcher. Um, then I'm creating an instance of my view model, passing in the repository that I'm faking. Then I have to call initialize on the view model. This is what actually kicks off the collecting coroutine to make sure that the view model is listening to the values that the repository will produce. And after this, um, because the first, I, first value is immediately emitted from my fake, I can immediately assert that the view model is now holding the uh, first value in its state flow. And then I can keep manually advancing the time. Uh, again, I'm advancing it by just a bit more than 100 milliseconds to make sure that the new value is produced and consumed. And as I'm advancing the time, I can keep asserting that the state flow is always holding the latest value that it collected from the repository. Something important to note here is that I'm not trying to collect the state flow uh, as a stream of values. Instead, I'm always asserting on its current value which, if you can do it, is generally a more stable way of testing a state flow. Because again, depending on how you're producing and, and consuming coroutines are set up, you may or may not experience conflation when you're using a state flow. So it's better to think of it as a state holder when you can, and always check its current value and assert on that. OK, uh, let's summarize uh, what we learned today. So first, you can use run test for testing coroutines. That's for basics. Then you should inject dispatchers into your classes that use dispatchers to make them testable, to replace them with test dispatchers within your tests. If you create uh, new test dispatchers, you can create as many as you want of the two types that are available, but they must always, always share a single scheduler. And finally, in unit tests where the UI thread is not available, you should replace the main dispatcher as well with a test dispatcher. And this will also simplify the sharing of that single scheduler for you. Some resources that you can go to. Uh, first of all, we've released a new coroutine testing guide this morning. Um, so you can go to the first link here. And that guide will contain a lot of this same advice in a written form. So you can review it after the talk and share it with others. And we also have uh, a link to the JetBrains coroutine test migration guide if you're going from the old API to the new one. And also, uh, you can check out Turbine for flow testing um, on GitHub. That's all I wanted to cover today. Uh, thanks for attending, and I hope you can now test coroutines. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Do we have time for questions? Maybe one or two if you want. We have time for one or two questions. You can also find me afterwards. I think we have no questions. All right, thank you, Dan.